Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. Maxillary acrylic occlusal splints are used in the initial treatment of functional disturbances of the masticatory system. Let us have a look at one of these splints. This acrylic splint can be used in the treatment for bruxism, which we will demonstrate here, by eliminating occlusal interferences and preventing wearing down of tooth surfaces. Traumatic occlusion, just open wide, where you will notice the full arch coverage to prevent tooth mobility. Temporomandibular joint disturbances. Here, misguided occlusal interferences are eliminated by creating a stable centric contact. An immediate cuspid dist occlusion upon any movement from a centric jaw relationship, which prevents the condyles from being forced into a traumatic position. Masticatory muscle disharmony is relieved by alteration of tooth contact neuromuscular feedback and reflex responses together with enhanced muscle relaxation. Now how do we construct this maxillary acrylic occlusal splint which is the most often used but yet abused appliance? Let us have a look at the basic construction procedures. Stone casts are mounted on a semi-adjustable articulator as near as centric relation as possible with wax bites in lateral and protrusive to set the condyle. Let us have a closer look at the analysis of the casts. You will notice premature contact in the molar region. Our objective is to increase the vertical dimension to clear this contact by at least one millimeter. You will notice we have now got a millimeter clearance. The next stage is to outline the splint. In the incisor region, a one to two millimeter coverage is all that is necessary. As we go posteriorly, two to three millimeters in the bicuspid region and three to six in the molars, depending on the retention that is necessary. On the lingual aspect, about six millimeter palatal coverage and tuck this line away from the tongue. One other aspect is that undesirable undercuts should be eliminated with plaster. Take a sheet of base plate wax, gently heat it, fold it in half to give you two wax thicknesses, reheat and then rapidly apply this to the outline which you have just established. This is only a rough application at this stage. Now remove any excess. This is a cross-sectional view in the molar region looking anteriorly. You will notice the adaptation of the wax. 
around the teeth, on the lingual, and the anterior section. Next, we have to establish even contact. We do this by bringing up the mandible and tapping gently to get even indentations. Notice the indentations. Next, we have to remove these indentations to get a flat plane just with supporting tooth contact. Now we have a flat occlusal plane with no interlocking of the cusps. We will bring these cusps up now, which illustrates the even contact in the supporting cusp area. Now we have to reproduce this occlusal stability in our wax. First, gently heat all the occlusal surface. Then, return to the articulator and tap down till we have contact of the incisal pin. This automatically gives us the correct interocclusal clearance. The next step is to get rid of the indentations we have created. Gently warm a plastic instrument and smooth out these indentations. Now return to the articulator and once more check that we have even contact throughout the arch. Our next stage will be to build up the cuspid guidance. This will be best illustrated in graphics. This illustrates the wax upon the maxillary arch. We can see the maxillary teeth through the arch and here are our anterior centric stops. This is the area which we want to build up to cause immediate disticlusion of the posterior teeth. Here is an anterior view showing the wax on the maxillary teeth. Notice this cuspid build-up area. When we move the mandible to the right, notice how this lower cuspid disticludes the posterior teeth. When we move the mandible to the left, once again, due to this cuspid rise, we get disticlusion of the posterior teeth. Back to the model, start to apply wax in the cuspid regions. A fair bulk is necessary initially. Next, return to the articulator, re-establish centric, and then gradually move the articulator to the right and then to the left. And notice we have an indication of centric stops and this immediate cuspid rise. Once again, we have to smooth the indentations in centric out, maintaining our cuspid angulation. Return to the articulator, re-establish vertical dimension, and at this stage, test to see that in fact, the cuspid rise does disticlude the posterior teeth. On this. Now we go ahead and check the other side. 
Notice once again the immediate disseclusion due to the cuspid build-up. At this stage, we commence to modify the overall shape of the splint. Trim back any excess, first on the labial, then on the buckle, right to the line that we established initially. The success of the splint will depend on its ultimate comfort in the patient's mouth. At this stage, we have completed trimming back the buckle and the incisal margins, as well as completing the lingual margin to the outline that we drew initially. Notice the even centric contacts. We check that these contacts are in fact still there and once again notice the disseclusion due to the cuspid rise. One of the most important aspects of occlusal splint construction is to make sure that there is no guidance upon closure to either the cuspid or the anterior teeth. In other words, we've got some millimeter or so clearance so that the mandible can move either anteriorly, laterally, medially, or posteriorly. The last stage of the wax construction is to establish a nice polished surface without destroying your careful occlusal indentations. Now present your splint to an instructor to be evaluated. Upon receiving the acrylic occlusal splint back from the lab, the first thing we have to do is to check the fitting surface. At this stage, we have to adjust the gingival marginal area to make sure that there's no impingement of the sharp acrylic edge upon the gingival tissues. Perhaps we can have a close look at this. The next stage to check is the occlusal surface. Make sure that there are no sur sharp surfaces on the lingual. In this particular splint, notice the curve coming from the buckle to the lingual so we don't have to do any adjustments. Now let us try this acrylic occlusal splint in the patient's mouth. Run your finger along the fitting surface to make sure that there are no sharp edges or blebs of acrylic. The splint should click into position. At this stage, we will first check to make sure of complete occlusal support. Let your jaw go loose. In and around the centric area position. And the other side. Noticed the centric occlusal stops that have been indicated with the indicator paper. Next, we will test for cuspid rise and disc occlusion of the mandible. Just slide towards me. Watch the disc occlusion of the non-working side. Now, slide away from me and notice the immediate disc occlusion due to that cuspid. Slide back a fraction and see the disseclusion 
Now slide right back to center. Now remove the acrylic splint. Notice how it clips out. And have a look at the marks on the occlusal surface. At this stage, we have to adjust till these marks just become pinpoints. In this particular splint, due to the care in waxing, we have very little adjustment to be done. For a final check, we apply some green occlusal wax. on both sides and the anterior section. Just open for me. Clicking in position. Now we run through our checks again. Just let your jaw go loose. Close together. Right. Making sure we have even contact. Close again. And that no cusp is tripping into the centric position. Open and close again. Open, close. Just open and snap together a few times. Watch the cusps carefully that they go straight into position wherever they want to. Open. Now take out the splint and verify that you have even contacts all the way round. You will notice that there is only supporting cusp contact with no drag marks as the teeth close together. All that remains now is to give your patient the correct instructions and then perpetually maintain the splint throughout the change of the mandible. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.